Hi, friends. Welcome again to another episode of Beyond the Clouds, Edge to Edge Transformation. It's interesting how in many ways we reconverge. Katie and I joined Cadence Design Systems in the early days when there were literally a handful of people on the West Coast. And Katie came in through the valid merger and I came in through an invalid merger. No, no, no. I came in through the gateway merger. It is amazing how much has changed. Tell us your story, Katie. How did you become the Katie Moore that we all know today? <laughs> well, Shankar, first, thanks for um, uh, allowing me to participate in this and uh, very excited to, to talk with you. And it's been a long time. So I'm looking forward to having a great conversation. And uh, there's no questions off limits and, and all of that. So I think I want to start with, you know, just a little bit of my background, but not so much from the technical point of view, but just, you know, who I am as a person, who influenced me and things like that. Like most people, I can't really talk about who I am without talking about my parents, right? So I am the youngest of four children and uh, I'm the youngest by nine years. So my next closest sibling is nine years older than me and then they get older after that. Both of my parents were, were born in the 1920s. So they experienced the, the Great Depression, uh, they experienced segregation. They went through all of that. My dad was a 25-year military career officer. Uh, wow. He was one of the first Black officers in the U.S. Army. He retired as a lieutenant colonel, also known as a light colonel. And I don't know why when you become a full colonel, they call it a full bird. So my dad didn't make it to the ranks of colonel, but my brother did. So oh. my brother, who is 10 years older than me, is a retired colonel, full bird. He was working in the Pentagon later in his career and was actually there on 9-11. Oh. Uh, and uh, that was a, a life-shaping moment. My mom was a uh, school teacher, but spent most of her career as a housewife and a homemaker. You know, back in those days, it, it wasn't common for both spouses to work. One stayed home. She influenced me a lot. Uh, a lot of who I am is because of my parents and, and their experiences and what they passed on to me. Growing up, I did a lot of things. I, I did well in school but without too much effort. <laughs> I, I just worked hard. And it was an expectation in our house that you were going to get good grades. It was an expectation in our house that you were going to go to college. It wasn't a question. It wasn't an option. So if I ever thought I wasn't going to college, I was quickly corrected. My parents believed in education. They believed in diversity and doing things to augment your education. And, and one of the things that I got introduced to early was music. I come from a musical family. My dad's side of the family, all very accomplished musicians. He had a brother who I was named after. Um, everybody knows me as KT, but my name is Kermit Taylor Moore. Uh, Kermit, like the frog, I used to get jokes. Actually, I got jokes more as an adult than I did as a child when people found out my name. I was named after my dad's brother, who was a classical cellist. And just like my dad was one of the first uh, Black officers in the Army, my uncle was one of the first Black contemporary classical musicians. I studied at Juilliard, studied over in Europe, uh, played with the New York Philharmonic, actually was known as a conductor or a director and has directed entities like the New York Philharmonic and other big uh, orchestras and symphonies. Uh, had a successful recording career, recording with people like, now I'm going to date myself because these were people who were, uh, apart from the, the classical side of things, he was in recordings like with Roberta Flack, Donny Hathaway, those kind of people back in the day. My roots in music are deep. And um, if there's a first love, it was music for me. In fact, growing up, um, I I wanted to be a professional musician. I grew up uh, playing piano, playing trumpet. Trumpet was my main instrument. I played that all the way starting at the age of like eight years old, played all the way through college. And yeah, growing up, I just wanted to be a musician. I wanted to perform. Back in the 70s, we had all these bands like Tower of Power, Chicago, any band that had a horn section. I, I listened to those guys. But I also, it, it, it's funny, trumpet is the instrument I was most proficient at. But I remember my dad asking me one day, he said, what, what do you want to play? And I said, well, I want to play sax, right? He brought me a trumpet. 
So he already had in his mind what he wanted me to play. Sax is still my favorite instrument. I've never learned to play it. I grew up as a trumpet player. And somewhere along the way in high school, I realized that while I love music, and I was pretty good at it, I, I, I was proficient, I was concerned about how that would support me as an adult. I, I had dreams of being a family man and wanting to support my family like my dad supported us. In my junior year in high school, I decided that while I love music, I better find something that's a little more stable, a little more predictable in income. And so I had that conversation with my dad. And remember, now he's an educator as well. So he started talking to me about different areas where I could go study. He said, well, you could always be a teacher like me. And I said, ah, teachers don't make that much money, Dad. I want to do something a little more lucrative. So we talked about going into medicine, becoming a doctor. We, we have a couple of people in the family that were uncles to me that were physicians. That didn't really attract me. We talked about law, going to law school, becoming a lawyer. That wasn't really appealing to me. And you're, you're going to laugh at this. He, he said, well, maybe you could think about engineering, becoming an engineer. My response is going to show you how technical I was back in high school. I said, yeah, I think I could. I think I could be an engineer. I think I could drive a train. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so we had that discussion and he was telling me about all the different things, the different disciplines. We talked about chemical engineering, electrical engineering, mechanical and, and for a man who never studied engineering, he was educated enough to know that these options were out there. And so I decided, yeah, maybe electrical engineering would be interesting to me. It, it, it stemmed from my interest in music because a lot of electronics evolved in the 60s and 70s around synthesizers and electronic gadgets. I even took one of my horns and electrified it. I saw a trumpet player that had done that. It sounds very complex, but it's basically nothing more than just putting a pickup on the bell of the instrument. And then you can connect it to a speaker or you can connect it to a wah-wah pedal back in those days. That was my logic to going into electrical engineering. And I'll never forget my experience in college. I, I, I attended Case Western Reserve University. I graduated from high school in 1980 and, and went into college. And I graduated from Case Western in 1985. Honestly, I was not academically prepared to go to a school like Case. It was academically competitive. Athletics, non-existent. But academics, it was just a highly charged, highly competitive environment. And it took me a while to get adjusted to that. There was very little diversity on that campus <laughs> when I went there. So there was the whole culture shock of getting adjusted to that. I, I persevered. I won't say that my grades were outstanding. I would say they were mediocre to average. There's a joke I use. It goes something like, some people graduated magna cum laude. Some people graduated summa cum laude. I graduated. Thank you, Law. That's the honest to God truth. One of the things that I took away from that experience in college was, and I got this from my dad too, there's nothing in life that you can't do if you don't put your mind to it. And that was it. I graduated from college. I had some really great work experience. I, I left Ohio and, and took an engineering job, a design job at Texas Instruments here in Dallas, which is where I had been, so I spent a few years designing chips and uh, realized that I enjoyed the work that I did as an engineer, but I didn't really enjoy engineering so much. What I really got into was the people that I worked with. And I got exposed to working with software. And at TI, we, we had our own software department. Again, this was in the late 80s. This was the beginnings of, of EDA. I didn't really care too much about the science and the engineering and, and all of that. What I really got motivated by was the people that I worked with. Worked with a good group of guys and I learned a lot. And at TI is where I got introduced to engineering software. We were using engineering software to design our chips but it was all internal. Now, one of the first things I did was I was one of the pilot engineers for automatic place and route at TI. Got introduced to a company called Silver Lisco. Early in my TI days, I got exposed to commercially available EDA software. Remember Daisy and all of that, right? I was working on place and route and I thought it was really cool. I was more interested in software 
than I was designing chips. The software that was used to design chips was an area that I, I had an affinity for. So after about three, four years at TI, I got approached by Valid Logic, and they talked to me about becoming an applications engineer. One of my good friends at TI was an applications engineer for Silver Lisco, and he just seemed to be having a ball. I, I took the interview with Valid Logic, and actually, I was only at TI for about two years. I got to tell you how this happened, because after about two years, I went and I did this interview. And Shanker, I bombed the interview. I was so nervous. I probably had beads of sweat on my head and everything. And I didn't get the job, didn't get a call back. Two years later, a recruiter calls and he says, hey, there's this company in Dallas, Valid Logic. They're looking for an applications engineer. And I was nervous. I was like, wow, they turned me down once, but I really want this job. So I went and interviewed. It was a much better interview. In fact, I interviewed with the same guy that I interviewed with two years previously. And he said, you're a different person. Oh, You are a different person now. A lot of it was, I was able to get the experience, which helped me build my confidence. They made me an offer on the spot. So that's how I got into EDA. I spent a year or so with Valid, as you know, before we got acquired by Cadence. I was a pretty decent applications engineer, but I decided I, I wanted to go for the gold and become a salesperson. So I became a salesperson at Cadence, and that's kind of where my career got into sales. And I spent most of my EDA career, probably half of it as a salesperson uh, with a quota. And then I'll say I spent the rest of it as a salesperson with no quota. <laughs> <laughs> Once I got into biz dev and product marketing and all of that, I still rely on my sales experience. I'm not required to go get POs anymore. So that's kind of how I got here. Um, as you know, I worked for many different companies. Epic Design Technology was one. I was a salesperson for them. I had a short stint with Icos for about a year as a salesperson, but I preferred startups. So one of the startups that I joined was a company called Mosscape. And they competed with Cadmos. My good friend, Charlie Huang at Cadmos started that company. Uh, but I was at Mosscape and we got acquired by Magma. Total time at Magma was about 12 years. And that was one of the longest places I've been. Six years was sales that was on the front end. And then I did a career transition into uh, sales ops and then biz dev and product marketing. And I would say I've been doing product marketing maybe 12 years. After the Magma Synopsis acquisition, I came back to Cadence in 2012. And about two years ago, I moved from product marketing for Cadence. I was in a couple different business groups to now running corporate marketing for Cadence. And I've been doing that for about two years. And that brings us up to today. <laughs> wow, what a journey. If I only knew the name Kermit, I would have used it. <laughs> Right? Yeah, I know. Everybody in my family still calls me Kermit. My sister will call me KT when she wants to like make it like a joke. Like, oh, you think you're all that. You're going by KT. Um, but well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you said some very interesting things. One is the role of expectations. How do expectations put us on our treadmill or some kind of a routine to achieve those expectations of more? To me, it's more about experiences. I started off talking about my parents. They were a big part of how expectations get established. In general, when you move into different phases in life, the specifics of the expectations will change. But my expectation is always to do the best I can. And that's just in my DNA, right? And it may not be good enough for the people I work for or the people I'm, I'm working around. Even if it's not good enough, I would like to think that people will believe I will do the best that I can do. That can get into a very positive feedback cycle. So yeah. You also said some interesting thing about being from a musical family. My interest was music, and I took every possible music project I could do, including yeah. the first PC, remember? I yeah. programmed it in basic language <clears throat> into the clarinet and many other instruments. Oh, nice. was, this is 1983. It was so exciting to be able to yeah. make musical instruments out of this IBM PC in those days. Yeah. That's probably why I went to Intel, hoping that I'll create music. And you're not the only musician. We've got a Bollywood actor's cousin as the CEO. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and wow. <even> <laughs> mm -hmm. And even Cadence is a very musical name. 
the Canaanites oh, yeah. and the rhythm and the tempo. This is what I've seen interesting about Canaanites. The whole tempo of the company is very much attuned towards creating like a symphony. You worked at many EDA companies. In what ways would you say is Canaanites different from all other companies you worked at? Wow, that's a big question. Having worked at Cadence twice, I have a perspective from back when you and I were there and, and now. Interesting with the name Cadence. A, a lot of people think when they hear the word Cadence, the, the first definition that comes to mind, like you said, is tempo or rhythm or beat. When I think about the word Cadence musically, from a Cadence perspective, it feels like we establish the tempo or the beat in the industry. That's a pretty obvious corollary that you can extract. But there's another definition of cadence, and it's also musical, but you pretty much have to study music theory to get this. When I think about that definition, when you hear a song and, and you're listening to the melody, you can feel when the melody concludes or when it resolves. And the way it resolves, the way the chords move to resolve the melody, that's called a cadence also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I like to think that there's a resolution in, in our culture. There's a resolution in our company name that we help our customers complete their symphonies or complete their songs. Their songs are the products. I mean, if you want to make the analogy, but you see where I'm going, right? It's like if you're designing a semiconductor using our software, you're completing your symphony, you're completing your piece of work. So Cadence also has that implication, but it's not in the forefront of people's minds. Very true. And in fact, it was the charismatic Joe Costello, the first uh, C of Cadence, who came mm -hmm. up with the term electronic design automation and the need for a distinct industry. Because until that time, it wasn't really recognized as an industry in itself. It was right. always an adjunct, like, oh, they've supplied some crappy software and we make the real chips. Uh, you well, were at TI in those days. Yeah. I was at Intel. And EDA mm -hmm. wasn't really the big industry in its own right. So if you remember, the early EDA companies were more about hardware than software. Tectronics, Daisy. Every EDA company had their own proprietary hardware. They might have used their software to design that hardware. They were interested in selling you hardware boxes. And in fact, I can remember in the valid days, I remember the name of the hardware system. It was an acronym called SCALB, S-C-A-L, some sort of a structured computer aided language design or something like that. We were selling those boxes at a premium. And the software would come as an adjunct. Maybe we get full boat for the software, maybe not. And, and, and the industry changed pretty quickly. All of the EDA companies, whether it was Valid, Daisy, Mentor, they all realized that carrying the cost of hardware hurt their margins. I think Valid was the first or one of the first to move away from proprietary hardware to Sun workstations. Oh, and sure. we would OEM and sell Sun workstations. And then we realized that we can't keep up with the inventory if Sun is going to change their hardware every 18 months. We'd get stuck with old hardware. So we stopped selling hardware altogether for that reason. And that happened before we got acquired by Cadence. Yeah, yeah. Those are the days where it was a computer-aided mm -hmm. design box and now it's all software yeah. and uh, cadence and ops is the EDA industry is one of the biggest components of the software industry today. Yeah. And we're talking software driven hardware today. The world has yeah. changed upside down. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So uh, like you, I had zero interest in engineering for people who are listening <laughs> out there. I only did engineering because it paid well. My yeah. interest was mathematics, physics, and logic. And that's mm -hmm. why I moved away from the Pentium team into what became Cadence and later what became right. Synopsis and so on. Uh, how did your career going from interest in music into engineering and then later into software and later into applications, sales, marketing, are you the same, Katie, or did your career change who you are today? Oh, yeah. I mean, life changed who I am. From being a, a TI employee to going into EDA, 
I changed a lot. There was a lot of growth. I was in my late 20s, early 30s. I became more social. One of the things I realized moving from TI to EDA is that my network blew up. It grew instantaneously. All of a sudden, I'm not just working with people at TI when I'm working for Valid or Cadence. I'm working with all the customers and in multiple geographies and locations. I grew a lot in understanding different cultures of work, different cultures of people. I used to come back when Motorola was just big Motorola and there was no free scale and all of that. I used to go up to Chicago and deal with Motorola. I used to go to Florida and deal with Motorola. And while it was the same company, the people were locally and regionally culturally different. Over the years extracted many different aspects of different cultures inherited some, threw away others and things like that. That was one of the, the big differences, the impact of, of the career path that I chose. And I will say this, I didn't choose the career path. It chose me. When I graduated from college, I had no concept. Even five years after college, you got to remember my parents, their generation, people didn't change jobs a lot. So my expectation was when I got hired by TI, I was going to be there 20, 30 years, retire, get the gold watch, whatever. When I left TI to go do the thing at Valid, I was having a conversation with my dad and I said, this is a pretty good opportunity. And he's like, well, how secure is this company? And I said, but dad, financially, it's great. So then I did the Valid thing. Then we get acquired by Cadence. He saw that as a job change. And then I left Cadence and went to Epic, which was a job change. He was concerned for me. He thought there was something wrong. Like, why can't you keep a job? Why aren't you staying at the same company? <laughs> Again, expectations and all of that. It was just kind of funny. But yeah, my career kind of chose me. There are very few times, maybe one or two times in my career where I proactively changed companies. More times than not, there was an opportunity. We'd get a phone call. You'd go interview and, oh, okay, this looks like a good opportunity. Or, no, it doesn't look like a good opportunity. Yeah, I never really had a plan. I think we are the generation of no planning, although we keep pushing our kids now to start yeah. planning their careers. Speaking of planning and changes, uh EDA industry literally got carved by companies like Cadence and Synopsys and, mm -hmm. and Mentor Graphics, which is now a part of Siemens. But it has changed so considerably. There came IP, and now it's gone way beyond just electronic design, right? What would you say led the metamorphosis of EDA into this much broader, all-encompassing uh, design automation kind of platform? Is it even a design automation space now, or is it much broader than that? Yeah, I think it's broader. We we talk about our software as being computational software. If you've got a computer science degree or you've got a math degree, uh, engineering degree, that you kind of understand what that means. The way I look at it, the problems we're solving have gotten so complex that automation in of itself doesn't solve it anymore. I remember some of the first applications that I ran as an engineer, even though we called it EDA and we thought it was like, you know, pushing the envelope and bleeding edge. A lot of it was nothing more than automating mundane tasks that we were doing in spreadsheets. The first static timers were basically just tracking how many devices you had in a path and adding up the, the intrinsic delay of a device. You didn't really care about crosstalk over time as process technologies got more advanced as designs got bigger and more functionality gets added the automation space becomes this huge multivariable problem that you can't really solve sequentially and for a long time the electronics industry that we supported as EDA our boundary condition was the IO ring or the footprint of the board that the chips went into but now you have to consider the physical effects on these things, like multi-physics, which is something that we have moved into at Cadence. Um, and there are companies out there that have solutions. But you can't disconnect the silicon functionality or the, the PCB functionality from the thing that it's going into and the environment that it works in. 
oh, by the way, now we care about sustainability and you know carbon emissions and things like that. Those weren't really big issues when I was designing back in the day. Also, the design automation space has always embraced the latest and greatest in software practices. Mm -hmm. And today it's AI. AI is everywhere. Gen AI is everywhere. As much as we in EDA have influenced the chip industry, in what ways are these advances in software influencing us? And how is it going to be different going forward? That's a pretty hard question, but I'm going to make a comment, which is, it's funny. It, it, it's almost like which comes first, the chicken or the egg? We're talking about AI and generative AI and all of these things today. If you remember, roll the calendar back maybe five years, 10 years, and everybody was talking about data. Remember the term big data. Our processes were generating more and more data, more and more data. The compute power was the limitation. The first PCs only have one CPU on, right? The first workstations only have one CPU, and then they would expand. But being able to process that data in the hardware was the limiting factor. So this is what's interesting to me. The companies that are building the hardware now that can support and facilitate solutions that incorporate generative AI and in, in these big, massive compute things, had to use our software to design their hardware. Mm -hmm. So one can't happen without the other. Our software gets better now because we have better hardware, but you needed our software to design the better hardware. So there's a symbiotic relationship between hardware and software these companies that are designing the big data centers and stuff like that, they will support that statement that, yeah, without our software, we couldn't de have designed that AI chip. Or if it's a company with designing a, an all EV automobile, they couldn't have the electronics in the automobile without our software. It's kind of a yin yang, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Did the software come first or the technology or the science? And I see now that we're also expanding beyond electronics, because these algorithms are so pervasive in other areas like drug discovery or geophysical impacts of things, weather and all of that, right? All of these things that require that type of science, which we refer to as computational fluid dynamics or CFD. And AI is just a way to make better decisions with all this data that gets generated. Very true. In fact, I call it the incivency spider. You can't you have yeah. to keep jumping, hardware, software. And interestingly, I left the EDA and did a biotech software company from 99 to 2006. Oh, and wow. it, at that time, I was an oddball, but I said <laughs> the same algorithms we use in chip design can reduce mm -hmm. toxicity of medicines. And yeah. that's what we did, uh, expert systems for estimating the toxicity of medicines. and. Uh, I think today we are doing a whole lot more and uh, the design space is getting much more interesting. One thing I notice about you, Kermit or Katie, I think <laughs> Kermit gets your attention faster. So, <laughs> you never seem to get bored. There's always something exciting to you. Uh, I've never seen a boring day in Kermit's life. What are the most interesting things that keep you in this industry or in general energized all the time? I never know what's around the corner. At this point in my career, I, I've been working with a lot of younger professionals and, and they ask questions about career path and things like that. And there's one piece of advice that I give that I was just unconsciously living by. It wasn't something I realized I was doing. I tell younger professionals, whenever you're presented with an opportunity to try something new with respect to work or whatever, Say yes more than you say no. I, I love diversity in the type of work that I do. I love to have different things that I can work on at any given time. I think I would have burned out as an engineer. If all I had to do was design chips over and over again, for me, that wasn't exciting. But when I was designing chips, what kept me going was one day I might be working on synthesis. And I actually was a human synthesis tool before we had software to do it. I had to do the mapping of, of logic gates and all that. But I also like working on physical design. I, I would go into the, in the dark room back when we had the Calma days, right? And, and I would actually draw polygons and stitch things together. And I just like having different things to do. 
um, when I was in sales, it was the same way. The diversity or the dynamic of my job was that I had multiple customers I could talk to. So every customer had a different set of issues, had different things for me to go figure out. I never thought I'd go into marketing, but marketing has its own set of challenges and you know things to go solve. And I, I think I've developed into thinking that nothing is impossible. I do get bored if, if, if I'm doing the same thing over and over again. So even in this marketing role with, with my team, uh, in, in any of the jobs that I've had marketing related, just because we did something successful last year doesn't mean we necessarily need to repeat it. Let's look at where we want to go. I'm always looking around the corner because I don't know what's around the corner. And that's what gets me excited. Somebody asked me, why do you like to get lost? And I said, if I don't get lost, how will I find myself? Yeah. It's almost like that, you know, the adventure yeah. of being lost and mm -hmm. then finding your way is very interesting, uh, which reminds me, diversity has been a theme, even when it comes to people in our industry. There was a time when all management was from one particular class. Today, it's a very diverse industry. Has it changed the way you see your work and the way people see our industry today? Yes. <laughs> when, when I first started in, in the industry, and, and, and I'll say EDA, I, I won't put TI in this category. That's too far back. Just throughout EDA, very little diversity. There might be some diversity in cultures and things like that, but gender diversity, not so much. There are and have been different cultures in EDA. We didn't really talk about it. There was a pivotal point, May 25th, when George Floyd was murdered, and that was captured, and the globe saw it. It really opened up opportunities for us to educate each other and learn. You know, most of my career, I've ignored a lot of the issues around race and gender and diversity. And when that happened, it was something I could no longer ignore. And I remember talking to my son, who at the time was in college. We were witnessing what was going on. And, and I said, you know, this feels different. You could go back to other injustices, you know, like Rodney King and other things. But this was different. To me, there, there was a point where I realized, am I going to just continue to sit on the sidelines and observe? Or am I going to do something positive to affect change in my community, in my workplace, just one person at a time? I don't feel like I need to go on a big crusade or anything like that. But anytime someone wants to talk about diversity and how they're feeling or have questions, I'll take the conversation, no matter where it goes. Like you said earlier, thank God, thank the Lord, we are in a much more unified space today than yeah. we ever have been. And hopefully they'll continue. You mentioned something about 9-11. Your brother was at the Pentagon at that time. How did it affect you, your family? I know it affected the whole nation and the world. But specifically, what's your story around 9-11? Yeah, so that was an interesting day. I was, I was actually traveling. And uh, I remember I was in the car. I was on a meeting with my boss. And my boss was working from home that day, and, and he was watching this thing happen. And, and he said, I don't know if I'm watching a movie or if this has really happened. And he went into it. And, and then when I realized what was going on, they were talking about this plane hitting the Pentagon. Immediately, my mind went to my brother. I called him on his cell phone. And it, as you can imagine, the network was choking in D.C. You couldn't get through to a lot of the phone numbers. Long story short, he was fine, but he was in the Pentagon when it happened. Oh. And he's Army. He's retired Army. Uh, he was a colonel, full bird. And a lot of people don't realize that the five sides of the Pentagon represent something. So each side represents a branch of the military. So Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine, and Coast Guard. But the plane hit, the impact was on the Army side. And it went through and all the gas and everything, that's what killed, I think, 183 people. Primary reason why my brother wasn't 
affected or injured is because he was on the other side of the Pentagon at that time. So you want to talk about events that really put things in perspective. And it, it really did. I come from a military family, you know, my dad, 25 years, my brother was 32 years military. It, it just renewed my respect that I already had for people who are willing to serve for our country. I was ready to sign up that day. <laughs> I was too old, but I was ready to do it. That's just one of those moments. Most people remember where they were on 9-11. Yeah, I remember very well. Mm -hmm. Our investment banker was flying in from New York and he could never make it for a whole week. And we didn't get that yeah. investment. <laughs> oh, but, and I was on a business trip and I couldn't fly home. A week. <laughs> rent a car and drive. I just drove. And it was weird not seeing planes in the sky for a few days, right? I know, it's like not seeing birds. Yeah. Uh, which reminds me, you have been a teacher, even though you didn't officially become a teacher. You've been a mentor, a coach to many, including me. When I see you right there, a keynote speaker at an event, I'm like, wow, he inspires me. So what inspiration can you give to students or young professionals today who are anxious about what's out there, the careers they should be doing, or people in mid-career about the anxieties this whole boom in technology has caused? What's the best attitude? How should people be ready for the next thing? The, the main thing is not to look at the negatives of things. People are questioning the good or the bad of AI. If you go back and look at these big tectonic shifts in technology, I'm sure there were people who didn't like automobiles when they were first introduced. When the computer first came out, people didn't like that. They're going to take our jobs and everything. And... If you look at the negative in things, you're going to miss the opportunities. That's my advice, is to always look for the opportunity in the next thing. And, and be your own voice. Don't listen to all the negative stuff. But for yourself, make your own call. Make your own decisions. Be open to new ideas. I mean, that's what diversity is really all about new ideas of accepting different people or different ideas. That's the biggest limiting thing to a lot of people's success. Their inability to try something different tomorrow than what they did today. Very true. And I'm going to try something different. I see a musical instrument right there. We've never <laughs> had music on our show. Would you like to play something for us? <laughs> I can just wow. show you. This is this is my baby. <laughs> wow. This is a five string bass. And, and I've um, heard you play somewhere. I used to play with a, an industry icon, Jim Hogan. Yes. You know, rest yes. in peace. And um, I'll never forget when he asked me to play in his band. It was at DAC in, in Austin in 2013. And uh, he had a great group of musicians. I was so humbled that he asked me to play. We did it every year for several years, probably for 10 years after that. I wish I could play something now, but... Uh... <laughs> Thank you for reminding us, Jim Hogan, who was an icon in our industry. He did so many good things. And we have mm -hmm. a whole bunch of musicians. Our DJs had his own band. But you know what? I did, I did play in his band once. He didn't play that year. But if you remember uh, Gary Smith, Another great musician. I, I played when he was in the band. Uh, and, and again, that was at DAC 2013. The Austin DAC. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, the 50th DAC. Yeah, and now we are um, uh, approaching 65. Design yeah. Automation Conference has become a senior citizen officially. <laughs> <laughs> On Golden Pond. <laughs> yes. yes, yes. <laughs> well... It's always a joy talking to Katie, and I'm going to call you by a different name every once in a while <laughs> to get your attention. <laughs> and thank you for sharing the personal side as well as the professional side. And this is why I talk to a lot of people, to people mm -hmm. who are listening. This is a joy to be able to understand not only how technology is changing us and the ways in which we can use technology, but how we can contribute and our personal stories, how we can bring it all together. We can't be sitting on the sideline and waiting for things to happen. We have mm -hmm. to participate in it, whether it's in technology or in the human dynamics, because we can't wait for AI to be responsible and ethical and so on. It's after all a bunch of software. 
Right. But we can participate in it and make sure that it is responsible, ethical, uh, explainable, and so on. Yeah. The same thing with all the technologies out there. Please come forward, tell us your stories, tell us the challenges, play some music, and that will be a fun, <laughs> fun thing to do. So, Katie, thanks again, and please keep up the music, keep up the cadence. All right. Well, thanks so much for having me, Shankar. I really appreciate it, and I hope the listeners uh, get something out of our chat today.